John Morant. John Morant. I have a sermon coming out about him as well. He is thought to be America's first black preacher. Uh, apparently, as a young man, he was just kind of a crazy buck wild dude, basically. And apparently, George Whitfield was coming to preach in his town, right? And um, John Moran, I guess, was like uh, a good French horn player. So uh, him and his friend said, who's this crazy guy in here, uh, y you know, yelling? And uh, they said, hey, let's go check it out. And his friend dared John Morant, okay, only if you blow your French horn in the middle of the meeting. So he's going to go in while George Whitfield the Evangelist is preaching. He's going to, you know. <laughs> Here's what happened, though. I like this. Right before he did it, George Whitfield looked directly at John Morant, pointed his finger at him, and said, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel, Amos 4.12. John Morant collapsed at this. And he said he could still hear what John Mar what Whitfield was saying, and everything he was saying was like a sword thrust into him. Totally weak from conviction of sin. And afterwards, Whitfield came and ministered to him after the service, and he said this. He looked at John Morant, and he said, Jesus Christ has got thee at last. So this dude was just bugging out. For the next three days, he didn't even hardly eat or drink anything. And um, his family thought he was crazy. They were not okay with this. He started reading the Bible and started not playing his instruments, and it, they, they, they did not like this at all. So they started calling him names, and basically his own mother turned against him and basically kicked him out of the house. So again, this shows that, you know, black folks in America, it was not the way it's often presented. You know, sometimes you, you hear um, the way these things presented. Um his own family did not want him to be a Christian, and it was providential the way it happened. And by the way, everyone and I was talking about us are a hardcore Calvinist reform tonight. So John Morant wanders into the wilderness there on the frontier there in Colonial, Georgia. And all he took was a small little pocket Bible and Dr. Watts' hymn books. He was walking along, reading his Bible, singing hymns, praying aloud, growing weaker, and he thought he was going to die. But then a Native American hunter grabbed him, and he said, Who are you talking to? And Morant said, My Lord Jesus. And the hunter said, Well, I don't see him. And listen to this. He asked me how I did to live. I said I was supported by the Lord. He asked me how I slept. I answered the Lord provided me with a bed every night. He further inquired what preserved me from being devoured by the wild beast. I replied the Lord Jesus Christ kept me from them. He stopped, astonished. You say the Lord Jesus Christ does this and does that and does everything for you. He must be a fine man. Where is he? I replied he is here present. To this he made no answer. So this guy started teaching John Morant Cherokee. This hunter started teaching John Morant the Cherokee language. So they were hunting together for about 10 weeks. And then the, the hunter said, hey, I got to go back to this Cherokee town. And um, he said to Morant, come with me. And Morant said, I don't want to come. He said, no, no, you'll be okay. Well, when they got to the town, they were not okay. Uh, Morant was not okay. They seized him as an intruder. And the chief said, look, I feel sorry for you, but we have a rule traditionally that if if – if you come in un un unwelcome or unannounced, we have to kill you. And I'm sorry. So they imprison him overnight. They're going to kill him in the morning. So he spent all night singing and praying. The guards thought someone must have been in there with him. And uh, they said, who are you talking to? And he said, the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember, he knows our language now. <clears throat> so I got to read this part right here. This is from uh, Free Indeed. The time of execution came and Rant learned for the first time the fate intended for him. Quote, the executioner showed me a basket of turpentine wood stuck full of small pieces like skewers. He told me I was to be stripped naked and laid down in the basket and these sharp pegs were to be stuck into me and then set on fire. And when they burnt to my body, I was to be turned on the other side and served in the same manner. And then to be taken by four men and thrown into the flame, which was to finish my execution. I burst into tears and asked him what I had done to deserve so cruel a death. Sheesh, right? Morant asked permission to pray, which was granted. He began praying in English, but then felt moved to pray in Cherokee. Hearing the captives speaking in their own language, the Cherokees listened and the prayers moved them. When Morant finished praying, the executioner hugged him and said, No man shall hurt thee till thou hast been to the king. 
Morant fully believed the man had actually been converted, and he prayed in thanksgiving, quote, What can't the Lord Jesus do, and what power is like unto his? I will thank thee for what is past, and trust thee for what is to come. I will sing thy praise with my feeble tongue, whilst life and breath shall last. And when I fail to sound thy praises here, I hope to sing them round thy throne above. The executioner took Morant back to the chief, who had condemned the young man to death, and begged that he be taken to the king of the Cherokees. Inside the king's house, Morant told the king how he had met the hunter, and how he had come to the town and been arrested. The king asked about Morant's Lord Jesus Christ, and was puzzled by the claim that Jesus was present but not visible. The king's daughter entered as they conversed and noticed the Bible that Morant had. The king asked what it was. I told him that the name of my God was recorded there, speaking of his Bible. Said Morant, being asked to read it, he read Isaiah 53 and Matthew 26. Morant said that his God had made heaven and earth. The king denied this. I then pointed to the sun and asked him who made the sun and moon and stars and preserved them in their regular order. He said that there was a man in their town that did it. <laughs> I'm sorry, isn't that hilarious? I'm sorry. <laughs> God, he's like, God made this, and he preserves him. And he's saying, if you don't believe God did it, who did it? And the Cherokee guy says, there's a man in our town who does it. I'm sorry. I labored as much as I could to convince him to the contrary. So now the king's daughter picked up the Bible, looked at it, and she uh, said with much sorrow the book would not speak to her. So she wanted to like actually talk to her. But the executioner continued to urge the king to have Morant pray. So he did. And as Morant prayed, several Cherokees in the group came under deep conviction of sin, including the king's daughter. She became so miserable that the king declared Morant a witch and had him imprisoned again with orders to execute him the next morning. The executioner kept pleading Morant's case to the king. So the next morning, instead of taking the young man to the place of execution, the guards brought him back to the king. Morant, at the king's request, prayed fervently for his daughter. As a result, the king, the daughter, and several others were converted. Now they embraced Morant and took him as a guest in the king's house. This is crazy. So then he begins dressing like a Cherokee and starts living with them. Then after living with them for a while, he he ventures out and spends time with the Creeks and then the Catawars and the Housals. These are other Native American tribes. This dude is not just America's first black preacher. He is a missionary to all these Native American tribes in the frontier of Georgia. This is unbelievable. He did this for two years, and then the Cherokees let him go with great regret. And he went back to his own family, and they had no idea who he was. He had a tomahawk. He was dressed like a Native American, you know, all this stuff. Now, there's a long story. He ends up serving in the American Revolution accidentally, and it's kind of weird how that all happened, but he backslid while being a sailor, and he admits this, and he discusses it because he wrote a book, but he was part of some very important battles while he was doing it, but ended up uh, recommitting, and he was involved with something called the Huntington Connection, which are Calvinistic Methodists. I don't think they make those anymore, and... The origins lay in the preaching of, guess who? George Whitfield, circling back. He was ordained to the ministry in 1785 and then wrote A Narrative of the Life of John Morant, which was published in 1785 in London. Then he began preaching to Native Americans in Canada for four years. This dude would go through the wilderness and preach to black folks, white folks, and Indians. But he had some problems uh, in Boston and other places. <coughs> Uh, because of mob violence. But listen to what he said. And I'm going to read some quotes and then we're going to be done with Morant. And we got one more guy, Equiano. He condemned those who, quote, despised those they would make if they could a species below them and as not made of the same clay with himself. See him criticizing the racism of his day. See that? Nate, I'm reading from Free Indeed by Mark Sidwell. Free Indeed by Mark Sidwell. It's a great book. And listen to this. Listen to this. This is from Morant's quote. Thus man is crowned with glory and honor. He is the most remarkable workmanship of God. And is man such a noble creature and made to converse with his fellow men that are of his own order, to maintain mutual love in society, and to serve God in, cons in consort with each other? Then what can these God-provoking wretches think who despise their fellow men as though they were not of the same species with themselves and would, if in their power, deprive them of the blessings and comforts of this life which God in his bountiful goodness hath freely given to all his creatures to improve and enjoy? Surely such monsters never came out of the hand of God in such a forlorn condition. Ooh, that's really good. Listen to what he says here. Ancient history will produce some of the Africans who were truly good, wise, and learned men, and as eloquent as any other nation, whatever thought at present many of them, whatever though at present many of them, be in slavery, which is not a just cause of our being despised. For if we search history, we shall not find a nation on earth, but as at some period or other of their existence been in slavery, from the Jews down to the English nation. Now, eventually he died in 1790. 
he was only 36 years old. Doesn't it seem like I had just read a lifetime 